agoris. So, um, the question is, uh, does the fact that agoris consume human flesh means that they are not true sadhus? Um, so, let me go, let me sort of break this down a little bit. Firstly, Swamiji, could you, do, could you explain to us about the agoris? And what uh, what what it is uh, what kind of sadhana they do uh, in comparison with the rest of yogi and yogi practitioners. Yogi practitioners. Uh, Aghur actually means freedom from fear. Siva has five faces. Sadhyojata, who constantly gives birth to truth. Yes. Uh, um, but, um, uh, Bhamadeva, who is filled with love. Tatpurusha, who is that full, complete ish, uh, consciousness, seer, the one, the reflector of all, uh, he is the consciousness of goodness. Aghor, and who is free from fear. And Isha, the, the root of the Lord. Or a seed. Those are the five faces of seed. One of those faces is Agora. Agora. And then Agori. From, from that face, the Agori tradition. <laughs> so the Agoris are free from fear. And they do practices which many in society re regard as very fearful. And they do these practices in order to demonstrate to themselves that I am free from fear. I am free from repulsion. I am free from all, all the attachments which uh, civilized individuals who are uh, adhering to the customs and traditions of their civilization, they, they adhere to these uh, customs and traditions. Uh, Aghor says, I don't regard those as important at all. They're not bound by them. I'm not bound. I'm free from all fear, all repulsion. I regard all life as being one. So if a dog finds that food suitable to eat, I will eat such food myself. If people are afraid to sit in the cremation grounds, that's where I will sit. If people are loathing to see death or to, to deal with skulls or bones, that's what I will use as my utensils of my worship. That is the Aghor tradition. Sometimes it's very easy to look at the behavior of an individual and we make a value judgment and say, that looks extremely tamasic. That doesn't apply to me. It may or may not be tamasic to the person who's doing it. I'm not qualified to judge the quality or the character of anyone else's But I do uh, uh, respect the fact that they are doing this and that, that they are making a discipline for themselves and they're trying to uh, practice that discipline of faith that that practice is going to lead them to a higher state of devotion. And it has emanated from one of the of Shiva. And it has emanated from Shiva. So essentially, a ghori is uh, to be considered as, um, in, in regular terms, mavericks or uh, rebels to the, to the cultural norms of society. And they choose to go beyond that which limits the normal, the regular social mindset. Yes. So that they can find their way to survive divine consciousness. Yes, and yet they still have their own customs and traditions of their tribe. So they they conform in wearing a black dress, in carrying a chanta, uh, in using uh, bones uh, for uh, various uh, uh, accoutrements or utensils. Uh, 
Uh, they they uh, always sit by fire. Uh, they often imbibe intoxicants. Uh, they, they have their own set of traditions and rules which they do conform to, and those who do so with sincerity and with respect and with love for God, hoping that that's going to take them out of society and out of the bonds of social uh, interaction and put them into the spiritual realm because of that kind of behavior. I respect that. I can't de diminish them in any way. I don't mean to demean their behavior. It, but I make my choice uh, I, uh, for myself. Uh, I am born uh, and raised in the Saraswati tra tradition. So I always have my nose in the book. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a different tradition from uh, their form of... of uh, of Sabana. But that doesn't mean I mine is better or theirs is better or there's no competition between those. I would look to compete with them. Are there any saints in the Aghor tradition who, um, you know, are, are, are the sadhakas such as myself to read about and get some inspiration? Oh, absolutely. Oh, and, and so many. Uh, um, I would suggest you, you look to uh, Gorakhnath. Gorakhnath. I would say, suggest you read about Loknath Brahmachari. Uh, I would say about Babaji. Mahavatar Babaji. Just off the top of my head, of, of just uh, uh, Swami Samarth. Uh -huh. he was, he was He's a Gorakhnath. He's a guru. He's a naked sadhu. He lives in the forest. He won't sit under a roof. He won't wear clothes. Um, he uh, he has a certain tradition. Now he may not take intoxicants and and uh, uh, but he he is a, a, a tradition of that of that culture. Uh, all of the, in South India uh, they call them the um, uh, uh, Shabri Mala. What do they call them? Uh, Alvarez and uh, um, the ones with the ear they have an uh, earring yeah. and they have bone and they wear a black dress uh, and they are uh, uh, it escapes me now. Would, would it be um, involved in uh, worship of Kala Bhairav? Yeah, or or uh, 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 they are not and they are four, and they are... Starts from A, I believe. Starts from A something. Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not thinking of it right now. <laughs> so, uh, so essentially then, um, as to wrap, uh, to sort of summarize, uh, the Aghor Sadhana would be suitable to seekers of a certain disposition, just as yogis or, um, you know, different people have different um, personality types, propensities for sadhana. So who is Sufi who would be willing, would be, uh, would be drawn to a little more sort of what we would call it. Absolutely. Sadhana. Absolutely. And we all seek the guru that represents to us the fulfillment or the epitome of uh, the highest uh, the highest representation of perfection to us. Uh, and that's why you go to some gurus and you see uh, in a big hall thousands of devotees bowing down to someone sitting on the throne uh, giving blessings. And, uh, or you go to other gurus, a Shankaracharya had four disciples uh, sitting under a tree, uh, just uh, with, with a few disciples talking about day and day down. Uh, There's nothing, one is not greater than the other. Uh, some people will choose to be the, the teacher of the middle school, and some people will teach the college, and some people will teach the post graduate courses, and we need teachers of all kinds, and examples of all kinds. It's so beautiful that um, sadhana is available to people of all dispositions, all kinds, and no one is left out. No one is left out. Find the realization of the God. So, nice to know that you're doing this. Um, 
Right. The next question is, uh, we're talking about Hanuman Chalisa. So the question is, what is the significance of the Hanuman Chalisa? Then the next question is, in the final verse, Tulsidas Sada Hari Chera, should we replace Tulsidas with our own name since we are the ones reciting? Well, let's take the last one first. <laughs> and the answer is no. No. We should become Tulsidas. We should be, it's my song, it's my story. I'm telling this story as my own observation. I'm not. I'm not just reading something from a book written by somebody else uh, hundreds of years ago. I am telling you like it is. I got full of devotion, and I saw Ram, and I saw Hanuman jump across the ocean of worldliness and find the true nature of consciousness, and I saw the consciousness unite with nature, and they return to the place of perfect peace, the place where there is no war, Ayodhya. Uh, and they came and they lived in Ramhaja, which was the kingdom where the supreme divinity is always manifest. Now, Chalice, means 40. And Chalisa means adventurers. And there are 40 verses which describe the adventures. And that's the significance. And it's very, very beautiful. Uh, it's written in Abhadi. Uh, in the, the, the poetry of old Hindi, uh, which is even, well, today we have Hindustani, but even before Hindi, there was old Hindi, which is a little bit like Chaucer's English, or it is to uh, modern English. Uh, uh, so, uh, in a very beautiful, descriptive, poetic language, they use 40 verses to describe the adventures of Hanuman so that I could get inspiration because he is the manifestation of perfect devotee. He just became pure devotion. In fact, uh, uh, Ram had to build a, a bridge to cross the Lanka. But Hanuman just said Ram's name and jumped. <laughs> he had so much devotion. Uh, he, he could do anything in the service of Ram. He could pick up the mountain. <laughs> why, why just bring the, the plant? What if it's the wrong one? He picked up lice and jeevan and the <laughs> He just picked up the whole mountain in order to save Lakshmi. So, uh, what is the significance? It's a, a tremendous reminder for us. We should become full of children. And we also can jump over the ocean of worldliness. Go invade the kingdom of the ego and find the pure nature of consciousness and bring this news back to awareness itself. My awareness will be filled with the location of the pure nature of consciousness. The Hanuman is such a, such a revered and beloved uh, figure in history and a deity and um, you know, people feel so much devotion towards Hanuman because of his devotion to his Lord. How does one cultivate or how does one discover the devotion in oneself as a devotee or as a seeker of the uh, life. asked the same question of Ram. Yes. <laughs> and, and Ram gave her the answer that he received from his guru. And he said, the first ingredient is satsang. Put the svarga of a varga suk, doria tule ek ang. Take all the pleasures, jitni suk, 
all the comfort, all the pleasure, all the delights of swarg of a bark, of heaven and earth, and put them on one side of the scale. Tul na taki sakala mili, all of them put together do not equate Josuk love itself to the delight that you get when you go to satsang. In satsang, we get an inspiration. We get to listen to the stories of the gods, of the rishis, how they changed their lives because of taking spiritual knowledge and putting it into a regular course of practice. This was the famous discussion between Ram and Shabari in the Ramayad. So essentially, um, to, to, be, to engage in satsang as part of your day-to-day -day life. And, and if you don't have an outside satsang, then you have an inside satsang. Or you can commune here at the altar. And if you can commune with the guru, and you can have a a true exchange and a true understanding of receiving, a rece a receiving of this bhavana, this feeling. What is it like to be unfaithful? Many, uh, many, many seekers, um, and I speak, I speak for myself as well, we often find ourselves trapped into thinking our way to devotion, thinking our way to feeling more, but it's still in our heads as opposed to in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And then we contextualize it and compartmentalize it and we are making it something that it's not. And then I, what I've come to understand is that devotion is just becoming simpler and simpler and simpler mm -hmm. in yourself and just letting go of what you think it is and just letting go of this being and just loving more. Would that be? I, I agree very much, but I would go one step even further when you never felt your way into a love affair. No, you just love. You just love. You never thought about it. It just was a natural response to that magnetic attraction. And can we lower our defenses sufficiently so that the magnet can pull us together? So, would, what, so in terms of practice, would chanting help? Because I find it helps me a lot. Right? The more I chant, the more I feel in love, and the yeah. more I love, and the more I want to chant. Uh -huh. Chanting is a very important tool. Singing is another tool. There are seven forms of expressing or cultivating that devotion. It's called Siddhanta Achar, behavior in accordance with the scriptures. And worshiping you. I've got a guided meditation with mantras to make offerings. Pot, I'm going to sing your story. Why is it? Why are you so important in my life? Uh, Hope, uh, uh, light the fire and make offerings. And unite with God through fire worship. Uh, uh, Sangeet, singing. Nareet, Dancing, I can do what Kali, I can do the Bharatanatyam, I can do the, I tell a story and lose my ego in dance. You're also self consciously dancing sometimes. <laughs> oh, yeah, then you're not dancing, <laughs> you're, you're performing. You're, you're trying to think, what are the people who are watching me thinking? <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I better be on my best behavior because if I let go, I may look foolish. Because we see uh, uh, pictures of the saints dancing, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, yes. Ram Krishna. But they dance with abandon. Yes. <laughs> yes. Total abandon. And that was the puja, pat, homa, sangi, nri. Question, what we are doing right now, explaining what we do, why we do it, what we hope to get from doing it, or what we hope to leave behind because of this kind of behavior. Production. And it's not necessarily giving a lecture, or it's not necessarily giving a sermon, or but production is ex explanation. 
because when I get to explain what I feel, I feel it even deeper. So you contemplate and you apply it. And you apply it. The application of truth to circumstance is wisdom. That's, that's how we do meditation. It comes along with your devotion as well. Absolutely. And our point is the seventh offering. I'm going to give something to somebody. Everyone who comes to see Sri Mana walks away with a new claw. Uh, they get some prasad, they get a tila, they get a blessing, they get a, a solution to their problems. Hey, lawyer, would you please <laughs> take this case? Doctor, would you please solve this case? Nurse, would you please attend to this patient? Everybody who mother is constantly searching solutions for every problem that walks in the door. She grabs every resource. She's a switchboard operator. She plugs in the necessities uh, with the, 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 the needs, the needs with the, the resources. People come in with needs, and she has a whole Rolodex of resources. Essentially, so that would be so for ourselves that we practice of helping others, giving sure. uh, whoever we have around us. In, in, in every way we can. And be helpful. Whether it be spiritual, or whether it be uh, uh, advising, or whether it be actually lifting up the bar, chopping wood and carrying water. Yes. Mm -hmm. In every way. So these seven attitudes, these seven activities create the attitude which enhances itself. It's a self-fulfilling uh, activity, and then it's called Siddham Achara. It's the, the Achara, the behavior, proclaimed by Siddham, by the scriptures. Puja, ha, home. Sangeet, Nrit, Pravachan, Arpa. Well, all of them. We all practice all of them every day. Now, can I make it longer? Can I make it more intense? Can I learn more about what does this puja mean? Why am I doing puja? Ooh, what do I hope to get for it? Am I bribing God by giving him flowers? So it's the attitude as well. Oh, certainly. The motivation is, is even more important than the activity. So it doesn't become transactional. It becomes, so the devotion, essentially we are refining our devotion from a very gross transactional um, attitude to, a little, to more giving, surrendering, and loving. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjay. Namaste. Om San Sirsvati. So then, so you want to keep expanding. But, and that also determines on what you're eating and what you're doing during the day and where you're working. And the environment and where you're meditating and where you're sitting and how you're breathing and all the rest of it. Yes. Yeah. So if we take the mantra, just a simple mantra, Om Namah Shiva. And think about the meaning of that. I bow to Shiv. And what is this Shiv that I'm bowing? Well, of course, it's divine. It's infinite. It's beyond conception. I, I, I can conceive of the Shiv Lingam. I can see, conceive of the picture of Shiva. But these are symbols that lead me to a, a, a greater expression of infinity. Yeah. Now, how can I limit infinity? I cannot. Every time I strive to limit infinity, it becomes finite. <laughs> and now that understanding is going to take me into that meditation, into that bhavana meditation feeling that the attitude where I am bowing to something that is growing and growing and growing and growing and not stop. 
Because as soon as I stop, I put a boundary. And now I have to ask what's on the other side of the boundary. And I start to go and go again. And that's how our meditation will grow. And so then that means contemplating the you know, Shiva in the mantra or yourself would be whatever you can contemplate, it's not it, it's not that. So you have to keep surrendering that it's not it. And so essentially whatever thought that comes, it's not it. So it's kind of like neti neti. It is neti neti, yes. but with love and devotion oh. added in too. Yes. Yes. And, and it's your own self. So you're essentially contemplating your own self. This is what I understand. Well, you can do it in any way. You can make a light, you can make a murti, make a deity. These are all expressions of bindu, which is the last form that you're going to see before you move into the infinite. The smallest particle you can define before it becomes undefinable. Now, call it whatever you want. But it, it essentially, you, you, uh, it helps if you have a sense of the sacred or the profound of it, then you just surrender. Well, that's the concept of, of uh, Hindu theology. It's about King Shyam to the priest, who abhors violence in every form. Sada Acharana Tattva, who seeks truth and harmony in every behavior. Devan Mho Pratima Sidi, who loves wisdom, who respects all disseminators of wisdom, all teachers, who practices some form, any form, of one pointed meditation. Sa Hindu Mukha Such an individual may be called be anybody who meditates anywhere in the world. Oh, no question. And it's not related to just a denomination or a religious affiliation. It is or, or blood type or skin type, color or, or culture or language or any other uh, of the finite aspects which we try to superimpose in order to classify. Yes. So essentially the, 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 the true meaning of the word Hindu would be attributed to the purest form of meditation on one's own self. Right. Uh, good. Yes. <laughs> in, in a very simple very way. Very way. And you can call it my own, one's own self, or you can call it on, on the God, the infant, or you can call it on Siva, or you can say on the light, or on a, whatever you choose to use as your definition of that one point of meditation. 